This is an unprecedented time. During this unique global situation, we've seen many brave organizations providing essential services to help communities in distress. This kind of support will continue for quite some time, and we expect many more humanitarian programs to emerge as we begin to experience the true consequences of the situation. Hi everyone, my name is Chris Gaines, lead trainer at SOPACT. I hope that everyone is staying safe, whether you're staying at home or on the front lines, providing invaluable support to the public. To put it bluntly, to learn, we need to measure. If you are an organization trying to define key metrics to understand the positive and negative impacts in the communities you serve, you are in the right place. In this video, we'll discuss how to define your impact metrics and how to leverage existing standards to improve your overall outcomes. But before we get started, as always, don't forget to smash that like button, subscribe, and click that notification bell so you don't miss any of the upcoming content we currently have planned for you. So without further ado, let's jump into today's topic. Here are the five crucial steps to defining effective impact metrics. Step one, align your metrics with your outcomes. Whether you've created a strategy based on the theory of change framework or the five dimensions of impact, you need to ensure that what you are measuring correlates properly with your desired outcomes. If you haven't fully defined your impact strategy yet, we've created a few helpful videos that will guide you step-by-step step through the process. You can check those links out in the description below. Remember that your outcomes are the things that change for your community or beneficiaries. For example, let's say you're running a meal service program to provide nutritious meals to the brave frontline workers during this global pandemic. Providing healthy meals not only enables them to work more efficiently and maintain their necessary nutrition, but also allows them to get some rest and ultimately keeps them healthier. This means you'll want to have a metric related to how your meals improve the overall well-being of the frontline workers. If you neglect to track this metric and continue to provide meals consisting mostly of fruits and green vegetables, you may never learn that they need more carbs and protein to support working longer hours and lifting heavy boxes. This could result in your program, while well intended, failing to produce the expected positive results. Depending on the scope of your program, you can use the Sustainable Development Goals or the World Bank as sources for good outcome metrics. GuideStar also has some good options for nonprofits and community foundations, and the Bond for International Development can be very helpful for international humanitarian programs. Step two, create metrics relevant to your output. In our previous videos, we've described outputs as the immediate results of your programs and as the prerequisite information to learn your program's final outcomes. Continuing our meal service program example, once you ensure that your meals are well-balanced for the type of work that your beneficiaries are performing, you might want to include metrics like percentage of beneficiaries reached and number of meals delivered. These types of metrics help you measure the reach of your program and the effectiveness of your activities. If you see that you are at the top of your capacity delivering meals, but you are still not reaching the majority of the beneficiaries, you can conclude that you need to recruit additional volunteers or a partner organization to help you expand your reach to further your desired outcomes. IRIS standards by the GIIN can be a great source of output metrics. You can even use their metrics as inspiration and modify them according to your context and needs. If you are a business trying to measure your social responsibility and governance, the Global Reporting Initiative, GRI, or SASB would be a great option for you. If your organization works on water and sanitation projects, UNICEF and USAID had great metrics for that specific cause. Step three, develop qualitative metrics. While numbers are always useful and easy to analyze, you might want to include some testimonies, stories, and observations regarding your program's activities and outcomes. These can capture any aspects of your operation that you might be missing through numbers alone. Maybe as we deliver meals, people have certain reactions or make comments about your service. If you can capture this feedback, you could potentially uncover a pattern that helps you better serve your beneficiaries in the future. Step four, combine qualitative and quantitative metrics to create deeper insight. To get the full picture of your impact, you need to understand the casual relationships in the data collected. Many organizations focus on correlations between quantitative metrics, which can be very helpful, but when you intentionally include qualitative metrics such as multiple choice options to try to understand the numeric values, 
you tend to get better insights than you can actually act on. For example, as your meal service program is distributing healthy meals to frontline workers, it's helpful to know how helpful they perceive your intervention to actually be. So we can complement deliveries with a multiple selection metric such as, how have the meals provided to me helped my situation? Potential options may include, I can work longer hours, I can get more rest, meals that are provided do not suit my diet, I eat a lot more due to the free meal service, I gave them away as I have a caregiver in the house, or I am staying healthier due to regular meals provided to me. Your meal service program benefits greatly by understanding how many frontline workers actually say that the meal provided to them helps them to stay healthy, get more rest, and work longer hours as a positive outcome. Step number five, design contextual metrics with a clear goal. Metrics should be designed with a clear goal in mind. For example, if your goal is to understand the severity of COVID-19 by state, high-level metrics like number of cases and number of deaths don't tell us much. To make more valuable comparisons about which state is doing better or worse, we can determine that it is important to see the total deaths per million people. Looking at this chart, it becomes clear that California, which enacted a shelter-in-place order earlier than other states, had a significantly lower number of deaths per million people at 48, versus New York, which has 1,180 deaths per million on a given date per worldometers. Also, even though Rhode Island has a lower number of deaths that day, the total deaths per million is 226. Diving deeper, a more relevant metric may be number of cases by ethnicity, economic status, and gender, or percentage of cases with a pre-existing condition or chronic disease. Zooming into these metrics in a specific community or county could provide relevant insights on the needs of that particular population, rather than trying to have a one-size-fits-all solution. Here at SOPACT, we understand that defining the right metrics can be an overwhelming process. That's why we have included all of the relevant standards in our metrics catalog within Impact Cloud. We help organizations to create custom metrics for special programs and situations precisely like the one we're living in today. Well, thanks for watching everyone. I hope you learned something new and I'm curious to hear what challenges you and your organization are currently facing when it comes to measuring what matters. Drop a comment down below and let's get the discussion started. And if you found this information helpful, don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel so you never miss an upload. And until then, this has been Chris Gaines. I'll catch you in the next one.